Hello there and welcome to our online service of worship and thank you all for joining in. Today we're going to focus on a short extract from Paul's letter to the Roman church. He clearly felt that they were badly in need of some good advice as we shall find out later. But first let us all join together in prayer. Faithful one whose word is life, come with saving power. Almighty God, your Son has opened us for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us new hearts and constant wills to worship in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are now going to have our first song, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. And that will be followed by our reading today from the Epistle to the Roman Church. Sirs, moms, ladies and gents, boys and girls, um, I'm going to read you a passage from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 8, a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer you bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Humble service in the body of Christ. For by the grace given me, I say to everyone, one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment 
In accordance with the faith, God is distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we thought many form one body and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is to giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it do it duality. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Thank you. So when Jesus gathered his disciples one last time in Galilee, his command was really very clear, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Well, it's ironic that the one apostle who did the most to carry out this commission throughout a large swathe of the Roman Empire wasn't there to hear it. Paul's time to get with the program came a little later on on his road to Damascus, where he had his famous encounter with Jesus. Twelve or so years later, Paul sets out on the first of his three great missionary journeys to carry out this bidding, empowered by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And a significant amount of the book of Acts of the Apostles is devoted to Paul's travels and the people that he met. There is an energy and enthusiasm for the gospel that Paul possesses that really is quite unparalleled. New churches were being created as a result of his journeys and others being inspired by his preaching. And from all this came the letters to the various churches containing a mixture of both encouragement and support, remonstration and guidance. Paul was working like a plate spinner, feverishly keeping them rotating on their poles, with some needing more attention than others. But like a good, true professional plate spinner, always in control and with his purpose in mind. But there was one Christian community that he hadn't visited and was very keen to do so, and that were the Christians in Rome. Paul's intention was to visit Rome before heading on to continue with his missionary work in Spain, and that desire he actually wrote down in this letter to the Romans. Now this letter was written 20 or so years after his encounter with Christ and is a sizeable body of work. The Amazon delivery driver would have deposited a large heavy box of papyrus scrolls for the Roman recipients to sift through and digest the contents. Happily for us it seems that there was someone there to sign for the delivery. Now the churches throughout the Roman Empire at the time of the Apostles were not established buildings as we like to know, but rather were gatherings or local congregations of Christians. This was the case in Rome, where the newly founded church would have been seen as a subgroup of, um, of the Jewish community by the outsiders and the Roman authorities. But within this gathering of Christians, there were clearly tensions between those of Jewish and those of non-Jewish descent. And hence, the first 11 chapters of Romans are all about doctrine. For Jesus in the Gospel gives us the broad picture of salvation, the coming of God's kingdom, the parables, the miracles, teaching and the resurrection, of course. But the letters of Paul are the detail, the how and the why, to help deepen our, the understanding of our faith and to cement and secure its foundations. And so it's for that very reason he draws breath at the beginning of chapter 12 and begins with this massive Therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Because theory and doctrine are all fine and dandy but Paul wishes to put that knowledge and understanding into practice. Well the word sacrifice entails giving or offering up something at a very deep personal cost, which is hard and as giving our whole bodies, living bodies, seems like a massive undertaking. It becomes more of an obstacle or a stumbling block if we allow ourselves to believe it is an impossible demand of us and not even bother to think why it might be important. 
Well, it's important because it is giving something back to God. It is important because it is our response to God's loving kindness. It is important because it is us endeavouring to do our best for God. And so we might well ask, how honest are we to God and to ourselves in that regard? How much time do we spend in sober self-judgment, as Paul puts it? Well, maybe reflection might be a kinder way of rephrasing it. Reflection is something that is encouraged now in many walks of life. It is seen with the professions as a means of self-evaluation, learning from experiences and improvement. And the way we live our lives of faith is not immune from scrutiny, as Paul suggests, and reflection will lead to that state of renewing of our minds. And so Paul was somewhat ahead of his time in respects with his re recommendation of reflective practices, as is known in modern day terminology. But underpinning it is a warning against complacency, or in the Romans case, an arrogance and the harm it can do to a church or Christian community. Instead, by recommending the renewal of our minds through prayer and reflection and asking us all to evaluate ourselves in light of what Christ has done for us, it will give us a clearer idea of the gifts we have each been given and how best we might use them for God. For the gifts that come from being a living sacrifice, as Paul describes, do not have to be spectacular. They do not seek to be noticed. They are there for the purpose of working for the greater glory of God. But the greatest enemy, however, is fear. The thought of what one brings to the table as not being good enough or being judged by others as inferior. And that's a powerful obstacle to many Christians. And this was the problem in the Roman church and has carried on throughout the generations. God will use our gifts if we let him and trust him, if we test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing perfect will. And so it's for good reason that Paul chooses the human body as a metaphor to describe how we are all linked together in Christ and how important each and every one of us is to each other, but it also stresses that sense of connectivity we have. In our garden, we are lucky to have a rose arch, which looks particularly beautiful in full bloom in the height of summer, and which we enjoy very, very much. However, within this mass of leaves, stems, branches, thorns, and flowers, of course, are a community of sparrows who have made their nests there. And it is, to put it very mildly, a very vibrant community, extremely vocal and particularly in the early evenings, chirping away quite loudly. It almost borders on an argument um, and shouting at each other. But it gives me that sense of movement, that life, the dynamism and togetherness which Paul saw as an essential factor in a working Christian community. Because as we are more than acutely aware, we live in testing times and miss those simple freedoms that were with us until only so recently, but now seem such an age away. It is so easy, therefore, to get our faith downtrodden by doom and gloom, because Covid has dominated the news so much and there's still clearly going to be difficult times ahead. And as Christians, we are not immune from this either. But with faith, there is community. With faith there is togetherness, with faith there is strength and support, and it is faith that allows us to see the bigger picture. It is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Paul faced many dark times throughout his ministry, but it was his faith in God and the Christians that formed the body of Christ that kept him strong to the very end. As he prays, O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory for ever. Amen. Sarah is now going to lead us in our intercessions. Let us pray. As we close our eyes in the peace of prayer and ponder on the words we've heard, we thank you for life and the love of God, for the gifts that you've given each one of us and for the beauty of the world we live in. 
We pray that we will take time to spend fully with you, to recognise in your love and wisdom those gifts in ourselves and in others, in order to contribute and cooperate in the healing we yearn for in our suffering world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We fervently pray for the leaders, their advisers and influencers of the whole world. Give them foresight and wisdom to guide us through this wilderness of coronavirus. Help them to see what is most important, to use their resources wisely and reduce the suffering of people as much as possible. We pray for peace in our world and that we can take this opportunity to make a new start to end conflict and heal the world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray for your church, for each one who believes in you and those who are searching for you. That we will pray, praise you and listen to your Holy Spirit and be guided by you. We thank you for our ministry team in this benefice, for their care for us. Fill them with strength. Give them patience and love as they continue to serve us so carefully. Give them and all of us courage and imagination to grasp the opportunity of such huge changes in the ex these extraordinary times to reach out and fill the world with your love as it should be. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We especially lift to you the young people struggling with the outcome of exam results at the moment. We need to look after our children first and foremost in every way. We pray for the ones we know. We pray for the ones who have no one to pray for them in so many difficult circumstances. Father, bless our children. Enable us to give them hope for the future. They are the future of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now <clears throat> we think of those suffering from illness, depression, fear and loneliness. We continue to pray for healing for them as we think of those we know now. And to thank you for the gifts of care and healing that you have given to so many, to nurse, comfort and protect so many vulnerable people. We pray for kindness and love to surround them and from each one to know and feel your presence in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now may the light of God illumine the heart of our souls. May the flame of Christ kindle us to love. May the fire of the Spirit free us to live. This day, tonight and forever. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Our final hymn today is Lord for the Years and again please feel free to sing along or enjoy listening to and thinking upon the lyrics. <laughs>
and as we come to the towards the end of our service we close together in prayer almighty god we thank you for the gift of your holy word may it be a lantern to our feet and a light upon our paths and a strength to our lives take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the holy spirit in the name of your son jesus christ our lord amen thank you all very much for watching again and i pray that the lord's face shines upon you over the weeks months and years to come amen